great. Can you say hi to the audience? Hi, and maybe nice. um, talk a bit about some exciting project you're currently working on. Yeah, so thank you very much. And thanks for having me from, from both, uh, both hosts. Um, and I'll go very quickly. I think blockchain and tokenization is the future of real estate and all assets. I would like to say that real estate is also the largest asset in the world, four times bigger than global equity, two times bigger than global debt markets. That being said, real estate is also the most complex asset that I've seen. It's a very complex asset. The thing that blockchain will do will create standardization, will create openness, transparency, and eventually liquidity. Um, as, as mentioned, I've been working for nearly three years with US REM to fractionalize traditional commercial real estate. Um, we do have plans to have a token at some point, but I would also like to say, which we'll talk about over the course of this, this panel, that tokenization real estate is difficult at the moment. So we are not doing tokens at the moment, um, even though we have some very advanced tokens. And one of the things I have been working on for really about the past two years is, part of that, is coming up with ways to simplify it, to simplify the offering. And I believe that will entail having I'm NFT to... technology wrapped around all assets. So I can talk about that a little bit later. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ray. So our next panelist is Nima Gassimi from Canada. Growing up in the residential development and hotel man management industry, Nima has built the house network. It's world's top real estate cryptocurrency backed by Instagram, largest real estate network. Currently the house network on Instagram has over 15 million followers. Nima once made a 9.5 million sale to a Super Bowl champion NFL player through his Instagram network. Nima also owns and operates a digital real estate marketing organization on Instagram, Keys platform. Keys platform includes Keys token, Keys metaverse, the first NFT collection, and map mentions. So Nima, can you say hi to audience? And also, can you talk us a little bit more about this Keys platform? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all of our community members and everyone that's taken the time to join us. I'm coming live from Toronto, Canada. And honestly, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to get the chance to, one, discuss with a very powerful panelist. Thanks again, Eden and Heidi for setting this up. And two, I think it's a special time. I think we're going through a very important time in the human experience and how transactions and how we communicate and interact is changing and it's really it's really amazing to be a part of it it's part of um being the, a change that will impact humanity for many years to come i've been in real estate basically my entire life grew up in the hotel business um started building family single family residences in around 2015 2016 specifically in canada and i started using instagram to grow in a real estate network and build an audience that was centered around one, working with people who are interested in growing their online audience and generating sales, and two, really establishing a new way for communicating with clients. And a series of events led to my partnership with five co-founders where we launched Keys Token as a utility token, a layer two built on Ethereum, and since then, that was November 18th. Since then, we've launched a variety of NFT collections and are now building a real estate centric metaverse. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in our metaverse world. But at the same time, there's tremendous opportunities in what is now being called blockchain and real estate, the convergence of two monstrous industries that impact every single human being on the planet. So I'm really excited to chat and get into details about everything happening today. And again, very blessed and thankful to be here. Thank you, Nima. Next, we have um, a panelist from Asia, Jimmy Shi from Beijing. Jimmy is a venture partner of Bu Run Ventures China. Bu Run Ventures China is a leading early stage venture firm in China. Having its heritage in Silicon Valley since 1998, in entering China in 2005, Bu Ran has managed over 2 billion US and RMB funds. 
Before his technology investment career, Jimmy worked for HP for five years and Oracle for 10 years. He is also the co-founder and the CEO of Dormi Music and the CTO of A8 Music. He focused on early stage technology investment in infrastructure, enterprise, software, artificial intelligence, and big data. So Jimmy, since you worked in the music industry, you know, say hi to the audience. I also want to ask you, what's your favorite singer? <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Ida, for your very kind introduction. And uh, I'm a very, probably a very strange animal on this panel because uh, I, although I bought a couple of real estate in, back in the Bay Area, but I'm not a real estate uh, uh, person in, in, in the sense. But I bring a different angle. Uh, I, I invest quite a number of projects in China focusing on pro property tech. So uh, I will share a little bit more later, but I think with uh, blockchain and, and all the Web3 technologies and innovations, I think will bring new insight, uh, new excitement to the construction industry as well uh, to the uh, real estate industry. So you talk about, about the music, so my God, God knows, you know, back in the old days when I in, the, in school in UT Austin, you know, we, we, I subscribed tens of those uh, membership from the music clubs, you know, sending, sending CDs to my homes every week. You know, if all the old folks still remember, remember those old days, but nowadays all Spotify, Pandora and all those stuff, but you know, mm -hmm. Uh, I was in the music distribution industry for, for a number of years back in the China days, you know, catching the mobile internet uh, time era. And I was the sort of a, a Chinese version of Spotify in, back in those days. Talking about the favorite artists, God knows, I mean, I, I only remember those old days, old school, the OGs in music stars and the new, new the non- Nowadays, the Snoopy and all those the mans, you know, I'm not sure, you know, maybe, maybe not my taste. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, good to see you guys, everyone on, online, and uh, hopefully to learn more uh, from all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. So our last speaker is Chris Bell. That's Chris Bell is from New York. So we traveled from New York to Canada to Beijing, now back home. So Chris works for Rock Point Group, a 13 billion real estate private equity firm at Rock Hill. Chris is responsible for investments and asset management across different property types, focused on value creation initiatives. Previously, Chris completed over 600 million of real estate acquisition, deposition, and leases, representing approximately 3 million square feet of commercial real estate assets and 700 apartment units. In addition, Chris is active angel investor, advisor, and consultant to various early stage startups. Um, currently, Chris also serves as venture partner at Republic. Chris, can you say hi to the audience and also tell us some of your recent project, breakthrough projects that you work on? Yeah, definitely. Thanks everybody for, for setting this up. You know, happy to be here. Uh, like some others on the panel, I have a background in uh, traditional finance, um, but as anybody in uh, who's working finance will know that there's a lot of kind of manual tasks that are involved uh, with, with finance. And so early on in my career, got involved in some automation projects, is, which is when I first got interested uh, and got, you know, kind of aware of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain, all the different kind of uh, aspects and applications for it. Something that comes to mind is uh, an early app called If This Then That, which is kind of focused on automation of different calendar tasks and other tasks. And so um, learning some different kind of, uh, you know, basic SQL and Java uh, was able to kind of, you know, get an understanding of how, you know, blockchain could affect so many things. And then, you know, later on my career, I got involved in, you know, private equity and real estate. And, uh, you know, really where I'm focused on now is, uh, you know, early stage prop tech and fintech companies, um, some different companies that, uh, you know, I'm really excited about are you know, insure tech companies um, and happy to talk about that in some more detail, but uh, you know, glad to be here with some of the speakers on the panel today. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, so I'll throw up some questions and uh, you know, coming from myself, I have about 20 years real estate uh, background. I born and grew up in a real estate family and worked in, in investment banking 
uh, industry and asset management has been in real estate for over 20 years. So I come from very traditional real estate background. And, um, but I'm very keen on this topic. That's why I'm moderate. <laughs> and um, so my first question for you guys is, um, which sector of blockchain application do you see has the best future in real estate industry in terms of creating values? And then on the other side, what's the major hurdle to move this forward? Um, and you can also talk about which part of, since we have a really international panel, so you can also talk about which other part of the world you see or the country you see that leading this sector. So um, Chris, I'm going to have you speak first. Sure, definitely. So kind of like I alluded to before, um, you know, one of the companies that I'm really excited about is operating, you know, kind of at the intersection of insure tech and blockchain. Uh, and so this company, um, you know, is actually started by, uh, you know, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, former commodities traders. Uh, so Wall Street and, you know, part, you know, part of, part of the work um, in commodities trading is they deal a lot with weather and climate data. And so this company is called Declimate. Um, and what they're trying to do is bring climate data on chain to make it immutable, um, you know, using, you know, kind of verifiable using uh, oracles such as Chainlink. Uh, but once a verifiable data layer has been created um, and it's easy to work with, then you can build applications and analytics on top of that. So including financial applications. Um, so insurance is, you know, a way to think about insurance is kind of like a kind of like an option for a derivative. And so if you're able to kind of create some of these things and make them, you know, create marketplaces, then you're the, able to, you know, incentivize different market participants um, and then kind of, you know, sort of kind of create and incentivize, you know, different behaviors. Um, so some things that they're working on is trying to bring carbon credits and carbon, off chet, um, carbon offsets on chain. Um, to, so that way um, you can kind of, you know, create a certain, uh, you know, financial incentive there for, uh, offsetting um, carbon emissions and, um, you know, also reduce deforestation. Um, and so, you know, as part of this, uh, I think that DAOs kind of tie in nicely, you know, well here where, you know, I think of DAOs um, as essentially, and, you know, different folks have different, you know, definitions, uh, you know, even, you know, with the acronym, you know, autonomous, you know, decentralized, how decentralized, um, but be that as it may, we'll kind of, you know, leave that, you know, as far as some more discussion for the panel um, and interested to get others thoughts. Um, but how I think about it, is I think of them as essentially vibrant or engaged communities that set out to solve problems or achieve goals. And so they do this through uh, incentivization or disincentivization of those market participants in kind of whatever specific field that they're working with. And so, um, you know, as you know, most DAOs are, you know, nothing more than smart contracts residing on the blockchain and they're formed to be digitally native. I think that the specific physical jurisdiction that they're kind of incorporated in uh, is a little is a lot less relevant, especially today, than say five years ago. And so, be as it may, I see a lot of kind of X Web two talent, Silicon Valley types, uh, founding interesting companies around the globe, uh, mostly centered in major cities. So, call it like a, a New York, Miami, um, you know, abroad, Zug, and some other different places. And so, um, that's some of my thoughts. Akuma, I want to get your thoughts on this. So in my opinion, I think first and foremost, and it's, it's a very similar answer to what Chris mentioned, but I think smart contracts and in essence, blockchain technology makes four things happen in my opinion. It makes transactions easier, more transparent, faster, and cheaper. So when I think about that, to simplify, I think smart contracts have already revolutionized how trading can happen and applications including marketplaces um let's imagine an mls that's on chain right it would drastically change the way that buyers and sellers can interact with transparency i think one of the biggest problems right now with the traditional real estate market is the lack of information available to buyers and sellers this makes their purchasing decisions tougher this makes their decision to put an offer or what type of offer and when. So I think empowering people through providing them with information that they can use to make better purchasing decisions 
is a major game changer when it comes to how blockchain is going to evolve the real estate industry. In addition to that, I think globalization, I think one of the greatest parts of the internet has been the ability for people to connect from different parts of the world. I know firsthand because I'm not a broker. Um, I wasn't in LA when I sold a house, as you, as you mentioned, for 9.8 million through Instagram, but I basically facilitated that entire deal. And if there was a platform that I could have just addressed the buyer to go to and connected with the seller, and there was blockchain technology incorporated, the entire transaction could have happened online. And obviously there's still a lot of pain points and regulations. And on that note, I think even when it comes to regulations overall, in terms of creating value, we continue to demonize regulations, but it's actually needed. It's just, we don't want the wrong regulation. And that's why I think a lot of the third world countries, in my opinion, actually have a major advantage when it comes to leading this sector, because they don't really have engraved traditional systems that they need to follow. They could, be, they could take a lot more risk. They could change the system and see how it works. And on that note, I think the two major pain points and hurdles are centralization and fragmentation. And this is a discussion we always talk about as we continue to solve some of these problems and look for some really valuable solutions. When it comes to fragmentation and centralization, there's so many different people and processes involved to the point that sometimes it's not even worth the amount of time and stress and energy for a buyer to go through with the transaction. And I think blockchain has the ability to scale into ways that allows global trade to happen with the four main ideas, faster, easier, cheaper, and with more transparency. Thank you, Nima. Um, Ray, since you have been on Wall Street for a long time and uh, you, know, you did a fantastic job on Wall Street, would you like to respond to Nima? Thing? <laughs> yeah, so I, I agree with what Chris and Nima say, but I also believe that a lot of the changes have to happen sequentially and in, a, in an order that will be smaller pieces at a time, rather than just basically going horizontal to vertical real estate all at once, because it's very complex. So I knew very little about commercial real estate until three years ago, when I walked into a room on this project I'm working on. And the fact is, to me, commercial real estate was embedded by the CMBS ABS market. So the debt side of commercial real estate has been entirely securitized. Right, whether it's been blockchain, not really, but is it is traded, right? The majority of that is. However, the equity side or the asset side of real estate, it's about one percent or less has been equitized, if that's a word. Blockchain will allow the equitization of the of commercial real estate or residential real estate because it can handle the data better. And Nima and Chris both mentioned the data in real estate, whatever form of real estate you take is very hard to get to. In fact, it's not democratic. In most cases, a lot of people can't see it. Most major real estate is owned privately, either by sovereign wealth, insurance companies, families, operators. So you can't see it and it's hard to invest. However, because of that fact, and I'm not trying to put cold water on the great momentum, the fact is that that private ownership means it will take longer to really go full mainstream. So I think the first places you're going to see it is in data management. You've seen prop tech. And what prop tech really means right now is really handling data that is coming out of the buildings and coming out of the properties. Uh, someone from Metaprop, which is a large New York-based uh, prop tech uh, VC, said a year ago that they follow fintech very closely because they feel prop tech is three to five years behind fintech. Because prop tech has not really had huge commercial success yet. There are companies, the VTSs, and mainly it's been controlling the thermostat from, from electronically from a centralized space. And it needs to advance where you have as much advancements as you've had in FinTech. But the first will be figuring out ways to handle title. My, my, my brother in LA, myself in New York area are in the process of selling my mother's house. The title process is ridiculous. That should all be handled on a blockchain very simply. It could be done right now, but there's hindrances of that happening. A lot of them aren't technology. The technology exists to do all of this, but it's just going to take some time. 
So handling the data will then lead to transparency, will lead to visibility, which will then lead to simplicity, cost savings, and eventually, eventually, whether that's three, five years, it will lead to far more liquidity. The other thing I would like to say, even though I am working on very hard on commercial larger buildings, it is easier to apply blockchain and tokenization on smaller residential buildings first, or even a, a, a portfolio of them, because it's just easier. Thank you, Ray. Yep. Um, Jimmy, uh, would you like to bring some different perspective, maybe from Asia? No. Nope. Yeah, okay, you're here. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm worried. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought I'm gonna lose you, so. <laughs> we'll see uh, you. All right. Yeah, okay. It, um, and it, all the panelists gave very good comments and uh, I tried to add up from some, a little bit, a little bit on my, from my angle, right? Uh, from real estate and uh, construction industry, actually, uh, the industry is facing huge, a huge challenge in the areas of affordability sustainability, cost of ownership, and uh, uh, carbon neutrality, and, and also many of the industries still requires huge labor intensive uh, efforts. And so those areas obviously uh, with blockchain technologies and web trees innovations, I think will help alleviate those problems. In particular, a lot of those problems, I think the panelists also covered like, you know, uh, tokenization on the real estate construction projects to make the project more, afford more affordable, right? So, so today, you know, those kind of uh, uh, projects are funded in in a in in, in a very secured and in a very private ways, right? So a lot of uh, parties can. In pop I'm hoping that a lot in the future there are more open uh, ways for people to participate in those projects and bring the cost down and so forth, right? That's one. The other one is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is really try to uh, eliminate the middleman or the platform as much as possible to enable a uh, person to person, direct to direct uh, sales model, not just sales and buys, maybe rentals, maybe a new version of Airbnb, uh, better ownership for the end users um, and, and so forth, right? Uh, the other one is uh, we, I think Nina mentioned about, you know, for generation, the new generation, I think um, the way they uh, feel cool to buy, buy the properties probably will be perform, uh, perform, I mean, will be prefer using a new approach, right? From Instagram to buy a, buy a house and so forth, right? As a new media for them to access the information, not, not just the, uh, uh, the traditional web 2.0 uh, media is, I think, uh, uh, probably in the future, maybe they will buy a house from the metaverse. They have a much better immersive experience before they uh, remotely, globally, uh, rather than show up in, in real person to have this agent to show the house and so forth. So I think obviously there is a lot of new technology innovation happening. In, in the web 2.0, people can experience it. I, I'm hoping that they even, even have a even more immersive experience, much more accessible experience for people to, to have this buying experience. So uh, also touch upon the blockchain infrastructure, right? And I think Ray mentioned a very good point that bring uh, various data uh, on the blockchain to make the data more transparent, more transparent and so forth. Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, with blockchain technology definitely will make the transaction more efficient. And also, you know, personal information data will be also will be on the blockchain in a private, in a protected way, uh, in a much more private control way, so that information cannot can be also shareable yet in in a much more controlled fashion. But yet, um, we can make sure that personal data is more reliable, more accurate, uh, rather than you know, and also remove the redundant to input the data every single time. Right? It's a very painful process for everyone. So we, we're, um, I'm hoping on the blockchain, we can bring a digitalized document, personal information, uh, financial data on the blockchain in a much more protected way. But obviously, as uh, Ray also mentioned, this is not a, technology is not a hinge to make that happen. There's a lot of regulatory industrial hinge to, to allow the hurdle to make it happen. So not, not just technology side. So I think that I'll hope in the industry because we are early investors uh, uh, 
uh, as uh, so we are looking a little bit further down the road, not just in a year or two, what's what happening, mm -hmm. we're looking at the project which will change the industry maybe 10 to 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, I actually have a specific question just for you. I know um, you are on the uh, venture capital side and I know you invested a couple of real estate or blockchain slash blockchain related project including timeshare, property management, franchise, can you share, if you don't mind, what value you see in this companies that you specifically you invest in? Yeah, there's, there's a couple. I can mention a couple of projects, and those projects obviously has not has not started to embrace the Web three and the broad technology per se yet. But I think I envision those those efforts will be happening soon, right? One of the projects I'm have we invested in late last year was doing the prefab modularized smart home, as a, they are manufacturing, right? So and people are struggling with the with the a timeline to to make a on-site construction to make a, a smart home right i mean it taking a very long time to, to delay and so forth and also you know some very uh, uh tough uh, environment constraint environment is uh, if you if it's not off grid it's not even possible to build it right and plus if it's built on site that oftentimes the time schedule is is always being delayed and a lot of people experience that right it's especially the people in the bay area have right, to look at it and, Customize home. How long does it take to How long does it take to build it? Right, year or two, right? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So everybody's very very anxious. So I think uh, prefab off grid smart home I think will bring a lot of sustainability, uh, sustainability as well as the zero carbon emission in the in the future. So uh, those are the projects we have invested. And the other project I kind of also mentioned try to do bring. Uh, uh, software technology as well as uh, robotics and automation to make the property management more efficient and less rely on labors, right? Because labor shortage is always, always a problem, especially in the developed uh, develop countries. And that cost is so high. And, and it's and also such kind of labor intensive work is not of their choice. So obviously how we can use big data, AI and the SaaS technology together with robotics, how we can automate it as much as possible for the property management to improve the efficiency and so forth. So I imagine those things also will be combined with the blockchain and the web three technology to make it more pervasive and just give it two examples. Okay, thank you, Jim. And I love those projects coming from real estate, traditional real estate background. I think those really will help the industry and create value. So Ray, um, Nima and Chris, I think you are all pioneer um, in the space, right? Blockchain slash real estate space. So what kind of advice will you have for the traditional real estate firms? Like a lot of my business partners, they are very slow in adopting or getting in the blockchain space. They thought, oh, that's very far from us, right? We, we, we should stay with the business we do now, or there are certain hurdles they think they have to jump. And what advice would you give to this traditional firms that they want to, you know, start learning more about space, maybe eventually embrace the trend? Yeah, this is Ray. Let me just take a quick shot at that. So fortunately within US REM, the founder is a guy named David S. Rose um, and another co-founder is Lizanne Galbraith. Both of them come from multi-generational development families. Rose and Associates in New York is a hun over a hundred years old. Uh, with with many many properties in 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 the east coast of the U.S. So because of that, we have exposure and access to some of the largest real estate families on the on the east coast in the U.S. And you know, particularly after COVID or during COVID, they were really focused on running their properties and their tenants paying rent and and what was going to happen. Even though some of them were doing were doing research on blockchain and digitization, that kind of stopped during COVID, but now is starting to pick up. And what we have found out is not necessarily what everyone that, that writes a research report on real estate tokenization and posts it on LinkedIn, which makes it sound very easy, is that there needs to be a tremendous amount of education. So when we started, it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to create a token. This was in 2019. Now you can make a token for probably less than $1,000. You can find people to do it. So the cost has come down. The technology exists. But what, what we have seen, not just in real estate, but in the tokenization market, 
is there needs to be enough buyers out there to meet the potential supply of people that would like to issue tokens. There are a lot of people, both in the real estate market, but in other areas that would like to issue tokens and are trying to issue tokens. And everyone always talks about it and ICOs and STOs and digital asset securities and NFTs as, as, a, secure, as, a, as a security. They are all tokens. However, what we have found or what I have found is there is not enough buy side demand out there to support a market. And this is very important to all of us that are trying to do tokenization of any type, whether it be real estate, whether it be you know, art, whether it be any, any less liquid asset, is we need to educate people in a way and make it simple that they wish to buy a token. Because right now, and I've asked this in numbers panels and meetings I've had, and if anyone on, on this, which is a global, global community right now, it's fantastic. Someone name a token that trades with more liquidity and potentially at a higher price than it was issued at when it was initially issued. I have never found one. Now, the response has always been Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is not really a token, right? It's a, it's a commodity, right? And I think what's important to real estate and what I, type, what I try to think about, and I'm thinking about if I could give an important comment for this, for this panel is a building is, let's say it's a 20 story building and is not worth the same. It's the, let's say it's the exact building in the same neighborhood. But if that building is not worth the same in Singapore, in Miami, in Vancouver, in Belgium, it's worth something different. It has a lot of different rules. It has a, a lot of different electricity, a lot of different taxes. So it's very hard to value real estate. A ounce of gold or one Bitcoin is worth the same or very nearly the same across the world at the same point. So because of that, I believe it is difficult to just say, hey, if we take a piece of real estate, tokenize it, then we'll be able to trade 24 seven around the globe. I think that is a, I think that's a simplization. If that's a word, it's probably not, but that's simplifying the situation. So when we're looking at real estate, I think it needs to be wrapped in a smart contract. So, I, so that, that I'll be in one second. Uh, medical and drugs are very hard to deliver. The asset value in, a, in, a, in an aspirin is that powdery stuff, right? But in its powdery form, it's very hard to deliver across the world. And it's hard to get into your body and it's hard to store on the shelf. So what did they do? They wrapped it in a plastic capsule and made it really nice. And thus you can deliver it, you can store it, you can swallow it and get distribution. When we think of tokens, they're gonna need to be wrapped in an aspirin capsule. That aspirin capsule is gonna be an NFT wrapper. It is going to be what wraps and controls the asset. The asset in that capsule, which is gonna be a smart contract, we have to remember how complex it is. So when we think about real estate, we have to make it simpler. So it basically can be controlled and distributed and invested in like an aspirin. And I know that's kind of a simple analogy, but it has worked well. A couple other of these that I've done. So we have to simplify it and we have to create buy side demand that goes with the sell side supply. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Um, Nima? Yeah, I definitely agree with a lot that Mr. Khan just said. And I think in addition to that, alongside education, information is only as good as your understanding of it. So I think alongside educating people, it's just as important to see action and see people take risk and fail forward. I think there's a misconception that any business should know what it's getting itself into when it gets started. But in reality, business is all about problem solving. And a lot of these problems that are arising are brand new when it comes to tokenization of real estate or many of the problems that Mr. Khan just mentioned. I think on a global level, there is the opportunity to unify and empower people in a way that's never been possible previous to blockchain's emergence. And I think for traditional real estate firms that are interested in adapting this type of technology into their business, it's really important they work with subject matter experts and get advice from people who are already trying and testing and learning. And in addition to that, it's also very critical, not only for this industry, but also for the future of where real estate gets its liquidity from and where people are able to not only discover, but also trade. It's critical to the success that people collaborate 
And a lot of the collaboration needs to be done with competitors. That's how to push this space forward. And whoever is researching and exploring, I think the, the part that I fell in love with Web3 and just having a community-based project was all about its transparency. You know, everybody's sick and tired of not knowing what's happening with all these types of traditional real estate markets or, or any sort of regulated space where we're lacking transparency of data and information. And starting with uncertainty is very difficult. And it not only kills creativity, but it also kills entrepreneurism. And for that reason, it is really important that there is education mixed with an open type of freedom marketplace for people to be able to interact, communicate, learn from each other, exchange information. The same way we're doing this now, hopefully there's going to be people from this you know, event that end up starting a project and reaching out to our company or many of the other panelists to get support and get feedback and be able to collaborate to move forward. And I think we really started to see this change evolve during the pandemic. People started to look for new ways to have a, a new type of lifestyle and new habits formed. And as a result of that now, we're in a position where people are looking for what's next. And that is a very good opportunity for entrepreneurship, as well as for entering into a new realm of business for traditional real estate firms. And one other note that I will add is a lot of the conversation we've been having, we started Keys Token as a utility token. Um, it has metaverse transactional utility. We built an NFT collection called Meta Mansions. And using these projects as a proof of concept to show developers and agents and brokers, brokerages, what is possible if they do take a new approach and reimagine the way that real estate is transacted, traded, communicated. That's been very exciting for us to use what we've taken the risk to build out of, out of scratch and show what the possibilities are, how developers can create a secondary asset to their physical real estate and create perpetual income far beyond what they currently get when they do sell their assets. There's just an emergence of new opportunities. And I think whenever an industry like this, it, it happens so fast. There's just so much information scattered and there's a lot of risk. There's a lack of consumer protection. There's a lot of unknown and, unknown and uncertainty. Out of this situation, there will be a few very big and impactful organizations. And I think the key to that is simply collaboration and empowerment, not being a closed projects and being open to sharing information, getting feedback and failing forward. I think that would be the best advice that I would have for traditional real estate firms that are looking to enter this space. Nima, thank you, well said. Chris, your last one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll take ahead. a crack at this. Um, I think, you know, building off of what Nima said, you made a lot of salient points. I think that hiring a consultant or in-house expert is a great way to start. Um, you know, look, as, as Ray alluded to, there's a lot of, you know, information there. Some of it is conflicting and it's like, what, you know, how do you figure out, you know, as uh, some would say, like, how do you figure out what's true and then what to do about it? Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, create a plan tailored for your company, tailored for your industry. There's no one size fits all approach. There's no silver bullet in my view. I think on the contrary, implementing any one solution, it just involves a series of trade-offs. So like, Similar to like an optimization problem, um, even an optimal solution in, you know, quote unquote, um, it'll be suboptimal if you view it from a different perspective or if you measure it using a different, say, variable. So if you're optimizing for reducing costs as opposed to increasing, you know, any other thing, number of things. And so, you know, you have a clear idea of what you're trying to set out to achieve kind of before you do it um, or to improve. Um, before you just kind of roll out a solution. Um, I think that partnerships are a great way to go about things. Um, you know, not all solutions you need to create in-house. I think that you can deal with established protocols that have been vetted. Um, and so, you know, I would just, you know, you know, implore, you know, folks to, to have an open mind. You know, I think that, you know, again, um, you know, we've, we've kind of, a lot of us have seen that smart contracts kind of represent that, that 10 X improvement over, you know, the, the incumbent system. And so, you know, it's, you know, in many ways, really kind of a reinvention of, you know, what we kind of, you know, consider, you know, laws to be. 
And so, um, you know, I think that we kind of, again, need to approach some of these problems in a new way and kind of regulate them in new ways. And I think that, um, you know, regulation shouldn't be seen as like a bad thing. Um, I think that, you know, just kind of just maybe going off of a bit of a tangent, I think that, you know, um, the, kind of the, the build fast and break things um, approach works a lot. It's, it's not as optimal, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with um, things like contract law, like civil law, um, like real estate, you know, they're, they're very complex uh, situations and very kind of uh, one of ones. And so, um, you know, a lot to consider. And so, you know, I think that retaining counsel and, um, you know, kind of making smart decisions is the way to go about it. Thank you, Chris. So um, given the time we have today, now I have to open the virtual floor to audience. We have about 15 minutes left for our panel. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit through chat box or YouTube comments because we have a YouTube channel open as well. Um, meanwhile, as I said earlier, we have some NFT passes to give away. So we'll send out a survey through chat box. And if you are interested in getting those NFT passes, please fill out the survey. So um, I have got some questions. Some questions are specific to certain speaker, particular speaker, some questions are more general. So I'll ask for the um, particular speakers. The first question I have here is for Nima. Nima, are your properties currently digitally, digital only in the metaverse on the tangible properties as well? This is a great question. And this goes hand in hand with the idea that the metaverse should be an extension of physical reality. It should not be only virtual. So our roadmap consists of starting fully virtual and digital. We launched Keys Token with metaverse transactional utility. We launched Meta Mansions and now we're at a point we're speaking with developers in real life to possibly start building some of these meta mansions to possibly start using our um, layers that we've created and the foundation and the formula of what we did. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, on March 18th, we raised $10.2 million in about six hours. And of course, the project had its ups and downs. And we're currently in a position where building out the metaverse and all, all the great things that are going to come as part of the project. But in the long term, our goal is to bring it to real life and metaverse mansions should have physical integration as well. So to answer the question, right now we are fully virtual and in the near future, we will be bringing it to physical real estate as well. Thank you, Nima. Next question is for Ray. Ray, how would an FT make investing and token more simplified? Yeah, so uh, nine months ago, I was a middle-aged white guy that knew nothing about NFTs, right? And to me, NFTs were, were fancy art with a lot of colors and things like that. The future of NFTs is that those are creative NFTs and they're here to stay and people can buy and sell them. And I'm not here to make any comment whether they're worth a lot or not, because I don't know. However, the NFT technology, which uses smart contracts and blockchains, is probably going to be, in my opinion, the most important commercial application for tokenization and real estate. What it does is it used IoT, Internet of Things, and NFC, which is near field communications, which basically allows by UC tags, which are being put in all in many products, purses by the likes of Gucci, the National Football Conference, soccer clubs around the world, Levi Strauss. Nike just announced through uh, Artifact, they're putting NFC tags in their clothing. Um, this will allow what Nima just talked about right now, physical property, physical items like Gucci purses, uh, all these things are completely separate from, from physical product. The word fidgetal, weird word, I don't really necessarily agree with it. The fact is, and you're doing dealing with digital properties, whether it be Bitcoin, ETH or, or, or NEMA's products, you're dealing with in a digital ecosystem. There's less than 1% of the population 
is really able to do that right now, that's savvy enough or, or willing to do that, wanting to participate in the digital world. However, four to five billion people have mobile phones and the four to five billion people don't use their mobile phones solely to make phone calls. Most of them use their mobile phone 80% of the time or more to be on the internet. What basically NFTs will do by, by combining NFC, near field communication technology, which exists on these tags with NFT programming, which is a smart contract, you put the two together, you can immediately connect physical, physical assets with digital assets. And by doing so, that is what is going to happen. So if people are interested in that, you know, it's hard for me to say it's just for commercial real estate because I think this technology will be used for smaller things to start, which will serve as a bridge to basically take smaller real assets, will extend. And I'm working, I'm, I'm honored enough and privileged enough to be working with the people that own some of the biggest um, portfolio suite on this stuff. And there's a lot of really cool things that can be done. It's global. The technology exists now. There's a very good research paper put out by Kathy Wood and ARK Investment in December of 2021 called Big Ideas 2022, I think. It's 131 pages. She and her team talk about 14 different major trends. The four trends to the four, four of the biggest 14 trends are blockchain, um, blockchain, digital wallets, IoT, and mobile devices. Those four converge together because of IoT. The Internet of Things allows the blockchain to touch with mobile devices. That is going to impact how people pay their rent, how people buy houses, how people do that, how people buy Taylor Swift concert tickets. And, you know, maybe, maybe Jimmy on through his thing is working on things like that. It's tremendous technology. It, it, it's not what we think of when we think of NFTs. It's basically a new form. It's a functional NFT. It's a ball bearing like in a skateboard wheel. It makes the wheel roll. It's invisible. So yeah, that's how I think it will change. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ray. So talking about NFT today, actually for this one, we have a special display for 2022. So the Tao DAL Digital Art Hackathon winning artworks display will show more of the NFT artworks later at eight o'clock. So um, I saw a some questions regarding some technical or logistic issues. Yes, we have recording for the session. Yes, you can, we'll share our four panelists contact information with everyone um, at the end of this panel discussion. So you will able to get in touch with each panelist. So let's go back to um, questions from the audience. I see there are questions more, um, it's a, uh, oh, oh, uh, thought-provoking <laughs> uh, questions. So uh, we have an audience ask, I agree the blockchain will be more efficient compared to brokers, but do customers need more efficiency to trade? Eden, who's that addressed to? Um, anyone want to take? Um, this question. <laughs> I was going to answer very quickly one thing. In all of these, these you know, blockchain type things, reducing and eliminating the intermediary is, is often a big, big reason for it. That's not enough reason. To, that's not a strong enough business case by itself, right? It, it's, it's an important component, but there needs to be more. If you go out to basically investors or VCs, or you go out to end users and you say, the real reason we're doing this is you eliminate the end user. That's, that's fine, but that's usually not enough. It's like in the financial world, most people do use Bloomberg's and Bloomberg's are expensive, right? And people, major buy and sell side firms have been trying to get rid of them or reduce the amount of Bloomberg's they had for years. And the business case has always been, we're gonna basically le less reliant on Bloomberg. And none of those companies have succeeded yet. Now they may, but for the 25, 30 years I've, not seen Bloomberg have a reduction in the amount of terminals that, that are being being rented. So it needs to be more than that. Okay. And uh, uh, you know, I had a uh, one more comment sure. on that. You sure. know, a lot today we talk about decentralization so much, you know, everybody feel like we're going to the direct person to person 
direct to direct model all the way, right? But I don't think that will happen in, uh, in much, uh, much grand scale. I think it will be a mix of the two world, right? And today we do transaction to person to person, but in the meantime, we do more transaction goes through middleman. Why? Because information dissemination is very difficult, right? There is a certain platform need to be there to do the information dissemination. I think the challenge the users would really want to see is uh, I want to get a, a more gross share right in the middle, right? Instead of uh, being being exploited by the platforms altogether without enjoying the revenue sharing in the middle, right? This is everybody want to see. And I remember back in Still, when I was still in the Silicon Valley before moving back to China, at that time Apple was just launched the uh, iPad. Oh no, uh, iPod. So we love the device, the music device. Everybody loved it, and I was making comment that you know why when Apple sell uh, us a uh, iPod, why they cannot give us a, a couple few shares of Apple stock. Right, that's early stage of token, right? But obviously, you know, for secure reason, you know, it's not going to happen. But that's the world is happening today. You know, everybody wants to share the growth, not just uh, give me a discount coupon, right? That's not enough. So, yeah, thank you, thank you, Jimmy. So, you know, in looking forward, right? I want to ask each of you one prediction you have for next five years regarding this industry. So if we have a reunion five years from today, 2027, what do you think we're going to discuss about? Chris, I want to start with you. Sure. Um, so uh, honestly, I think within five years, um, the conversation won't really be centered around blockchain as a technology. Um, I, I think that it's just going to become accepted as it, the base layer of truth on the internet, as far as digital forms of value, uh, similar to like an HTTP IP uh, with the internet. Um, it, it's going to just be abstract. It's my view that it's going to be abstracted away, similar to like your no code website construction um, apps. Um, I think that with the security uh, immutability um, aspects, um, I think those are really good. There's a lot of other hurdles that need to be solved for mass adoption and usage by individuals, companies, governments, um, and, you know, and beyond. And I think that, um, you know, those hurdles would best be overcome by abstracting away that complexity, making it um, accessible for everyone. Um, and then having, you know, again, some of these things like, um, you know, data as a base layer, building different things on top of that, and then thereby monetizing those um, analytics models, apps, uh, et cetera. And so, that, you know, that's my view is that, you know, five years that we won't even be, it won't even be a debate about blockchain. Ray? Uh, following on Chris, the blockchain will be most successful if it's operated efficiently and no one sees it. So when you look at the internet, the internet is a, an amazing amount of, of technology going on right now that we're able to talk to each other around the globe. And I have no idea how they made it, who made it, or what's happening, but it's amazing. But I know I hit a green button that says log in, right? We will have the most success in tokenization of real estate if the blockchain is operating invisibly. That will mean that the mo more mainstream people will be able to use it and it will be available to them. One other thing, I actually think you will see smaller real assets, whether it be gold, um, diamonds, minerals, um, real assets that have value, have base value. I think you will see them tokenized first. And I think that will be very beneficial to tokenizing real estate because I think people need to see and trust tokens as a financial asset. And so whoever can come up with some of those that are trustworthy and trade, they don't have to trade as much as Bitcoin. They don't have to trade 24 seven, but to trade and be valued as a good financial product that will then allow other real assets, which re which real estate is the largest real asset in the world, to basically then follow. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Jimmy? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm making it very simple, right? So I'm hoping that uh, five years down the road, you know, when we're attending all those uh, Web3 conference, there will be a huge track talking about 
how Web3 will embrace the physical economic world, including real estate. And when we're attending the real estate conference, everybody will talk about Web3 and real estate and a value network and so forth. So everybody become a norm when we talk about Web3 and plus the traditional industry. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you, Jimmy. Nima. Yeah, I think there's so many different ways to answer this question. And mm -hmm. it's really an exciting time as we started talking about this. But in my opinion, we're early. And in the next five years, I wholeheartedly believe that virtual real estate is going to outperform physical real estate. And due to its accessibilities, utilities, scalability, the potential to have events and gamings and all sorts of revenue generating activities in a, in a digital space. That's a very exciting opportunity. And I, it's one that I hope I can share with a lot of people who are on this panel. We've had a tremendous um, discussion here and it's been really amazing hearing so many different opinions and different frameworks. And I think five years from now, we will be looking back and realizing how early we were and how amazing it is to be such an early creator in this space. So thank you everyone for having me. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you, Ima, Bray, Jimmy, and Chris. So um, we have, we're, we're going to move to our next session, panel two discussion. The topics, real estate and metaverse. Ning, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eden. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so it's a great honor to be uh, the moderator today. So for panel two, uh, we have a strong panel that has a lot of experience on Web3, Metaverse, and gamification. Uh, however, before we get into the panel, uh, I'll take a few minutes to briefly introduce myself, uh, Diesel, and an NFT project that I've been working on earlier. Uh, so my name is Ling Ning. Uh, I got a PhD in neuroscience and was a former scientist at Stanford University. Uh, right now, I'm the venture partner at Valkyrie Fund uh, and the vice president of Diesel. Uh, so let me share with you uh, my slides. Okay, so uh, what is Diesel? Uh, Diesel is a nonprofit organization uh, that focuses on advancing blockchain technology, facilitating collaborations for technology adoption, and bridging the gap between the crypto community and the mainstream. There are three directions we're pursuing technology development, academic research, and industry application. Uh, so I'm going to talk more about SustainaDAO, uh, which is a research uh, project that we've been working on. So SustainaDAO is a Web3 project that diesel leverage cross-sector and cross-border collaborations uh, to pursue sustainable development goals. It was conceptualized at the beginning of 2022. Uh, so far, we have organized a digital art hackathon in April, uh, which I will talk more shortly. Uh, right now, uh, we're working on a podcast named Non-Fungible Talk, uh, where we interview experts and influencers uh, from Web3 initiatives and funds. Uh, later on this year, uh, we have uh, some training program for the next generation Web3 entrepreneurs. And in the near future, we're planning to launch Web3 apps, virtual land, tokens, and move forward to metaverse and ultimately to the real world project. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the digital art hackathon. Uh, so Sustainable Digital Art Hackathon was part of the United Nations Youth Leadership Program. Uh, we worked closely with SIIP Foundation as an, and SIS Conference. Uh, the hackathon was primarily facing students aged between 6 to 25. The participants were asked to create a digital art of any form on the theme of United Nations 17 Sustainability Development Goals and a short video telling the idea and inspiration of their work. The goal of the event is to arise the awareness of sustainability issues and engage the young generation to take actions in addressing such issues. Uh, the hackathon attracted five, more than 500 participants from three continents, and the event has more than 10,000 online viewers at its peak time. 
But beyond those numbers, the real impact of this hackathon was evidenced by the change in actions. Uh, for example, uh, Danny, uh, a six-year-old boy who lived in California, uh, one of our youngest participants, with his four-year-old sister started to take the responsibility at home to sort and recycle garbage after creating uh, his digital painting on garbage sorting. So this is just one of the story. Uh, without overdue, uh, I will show you uh, some of the selected artwork uh, from this digital art hackathon collection. So, so for those who are on Twitter space, won't be able to uh, see the pictures, uh, but we will drop uh, a link, uh, our OpenSea link in the comments so that you can access the NFT collection of this artwork from there. So uh, we have received a large, uh, the artwork received covers a variety of topics, including climate, environment, uh, clean water and energy, wildlife conservation, zero hunger, mental and physical health, gender and race equality. So what impressed me the most while hosting this hackathon event was through the interaction uh, with the young artist. The enthusiasm towards art and technology, a goodwill towards a sustainable future uh, where human, nature, and technology interact in a harmonious way, as well as their sense of social responsibility motivate us to stay true to our value and be committed to our mission. So this is an example of how one of the NFT looks like uh, from this collection. So if you want to see more or if you want to support uh, the young artist or our initiative, you can find this NFT collection on OpenSea from the uh, link we just dropped. And I would also like to uh, remind you that uh, we have a survey going on right now uh, it, and it has been uh, dropped in the chat or the comment section in YouTube and Twitter space. Uh, so yeah, so if you finish the survey, uh, you have a chance to win one of the 32 diamond pass giveaway and this is how they look like. Um, okay, so uh, now is the, it comes the exciting time. Uh, let's welcome uh, our panelists. So the first panelist I want to introduce is Scarlett Chen. Scarlett is the CEO of Robinland. Robinland tokenizes high quality commercial real estate dApps into an on-chain crypto tokens to help real estate developers access liquidity from DeFi lenders. Scarlett holds a PhD in economics from Stanford, focusing on finance innovations in the housing and real estate market. She was an ex-data scientist at Google and Shopify and ex-CEO and IR at several Bay Area consumer facing startups. Uh, welcome, Stack Scarlett. Uh, would you like to tell us more about Robinland? Um, thanks so much for inviting me to this event. It's a great pleasure to be here. And at Robinland, what we're trying to build essentially is a bridge between uh, TreadFi and DeFi, especially for the real estate industry on the liquidity side. So you can think of us as uh, channeling access liquidity, for example, USDC from the on-chain world, uh, from people holding crypto into the boring demands of say real estate developers um, in the TradFi industry. So historically speaking, you know, in crypto, you can see very high APR, like 200% everywhere, but that was because of a bull run. And now because of the market collapse, a lot of people are actually working very hard to solve this yield crisis where you see you know, one or 2% risk-free rates and in the on-chain environment. And we're precisely here to help because on the other hand, in the USD environment, you see like eight to 10% uh, you know, return if you, for example, invest in a real estate construction loan project. Um, so that's why we're building a fully composable uh, blockchain, uh, essentially a protocol that allows people to invest their USDC to access these high quality real estate projects. And we will be live over the next few weeks. Um, and I can also send essentially the link to our test net and have everyone participate in testing out our product. And thanks every, uh, you know, for, for having me here and really excited um, to talk about uh, metaverse, NFT, blockchain, and real estate in this panel. Thank you, Scarlett. It's great to have you here. Uh, our next speaker is Arthur Hu. 
Arthur got his PhD from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he is a financial planning business owner. He is an early investor of metaverse land, including NFT world, worldwide, webland, and other side. He's also a 2018 crypto bear market survivor. Hi, Arthur. Uh, could you tell us, uh, t tell our audience about what kind of cool project you've been working on lately? Hey, everyone. This is Arthur Hu. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, having me here. So I'm a financial planner um, and then um, doing basically uh, providing financial education uh, and also uh, financial services to uh, mass market. Um, so um, uh, since last year, this NFT uh, topic is pretty hot and a lot of my clients start to look into that. Um, and um, um, some of them make great gains. Some of them uh, hope not losing their life, their, uh, life saving. So, uh, um, I, you know, one message I always talk to my client is, uh, before you spend any ease, uh, buying any NFTs, or open seas or look square, uh, you better talk to some financial planners, um, that you trust to really, um, make your financial foundation, um, stable before you go into the risky NFT investment or speculating game. Um, yeah, so um, that's, that's what I'm doing. And uh, I'm glad to share more about uh, the Metaverse project I invested um, in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. It's great to have you here too. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Melvis Lainto. Uh, Melvis is the VP and strategy of marketing in Fentacore. Fentacore is an ecosystem that combines the gaming community, NFTs, and a game development launcher with gamified games into one fluid platform for all. Melvis is also the head of BD and client solution strategy, sales and business management at OKCoin. He was the former VP and JP Morgan. Uh, so also besides a long list of professional experience in finance and Web3, Melvis was also a competitive basketball player. Oh, wow. Uh, welcome, Melvis. So yeah, I'm just curious now with the famously uh, fast moving Web3 project, uh, are you, do you still have time to play basketball these days? Yeah, I still am able to go to the gym and play a little bit. Uh, and I recently moved to Miami from uh, New York. So we'll need to find the courts or the gyms to play a little bit more basketball. But yeah, thank you everyone uh, for having me. And in terms of the, the metaverse uh, uh, segments of uh, this, these discussions today around uh, real estate, I am uh, assisting with the uh, development of uh, Fantacore, which is uh, gaming as a service. And with it, it's a game five platform that brings together gamers, developers, investors, and uh, and studios to one harmonious platform to enable them to play to earn, build to earn. There's a game launcher, multi-game uh, ecosystem, a game asset test, uh, asset staking, NFT marketplace, a game asset swap tool, and also uh, social channels for uh, the community members to engage with. So at a whole, in its essence, Fanacore is an ecosystem that combines gaming community, NFTs, and game developers, uh, and game development into one fluid platform. With it, I'm very excited about the topics today because um, GameFi, in addition to Metaverse, all come into play um, as the crypto and blockchain ecosystem is being developed. One of the biggest key things are that uh, within the metaverse, uh, the definition just was, uh, is pretty recent. And so the main structures around the types of use cases, the applications, the different platform developments and underlying foundations of the metaverse are still relatively new. And with it, uh, the virtual real estate uh, ecosystem component of it is also fairly uh, nascent right now. And I'm, I'm excited to be here today and look forward to dive deeper into the questions around virtual land, game fi, and also real estate as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mavis. Uh, so before we move forward to the, uh, to the actual panel questions, I remind our panelists on this panel to turn on your speaker on Twitter space. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, why don't we start the panel, um, by telling our audience what is your favorite virtual land project and how may this project shape the future of Web3 industry and the real estate industry. 
Uh, how about we start with Scarlett? Sure, yeah, I was uh, trying to unmute. Um, so to me, actually, I really like uh, Theopatra Labs and Balcony Dell. These are not exactly, um, uh, you know, virtual land projects, but I think they essentially solve really important problems for, for example, tokenization of real estate. So Theopatra Lab, I like them because they found a legal solution to the problem of transferring returns. So historically speaking, a lot of projects have been trying to essentially quote unquote tokenize real estate, put them on chain, but the problem is always the legal uh, aspect of things, which is as long as you do that, you created a security. And that means you usually have to go through Reg D and Reg S, but they found a solution which was to find a Stacks blockchain on which the transferring of uh, essentially payments are actually regarded as a mining activity. So by doing that, they essentially um, have sort of um, uh, find another way um, to essentially uh, attract, attract users, um, you know, paying out these dividends without being classified as uh, security. So that's something that I really liked. And for Balcony Dow, they, uh, the reason I like them is because uh, for, for a long time, what we've been struggling in this field is the price oracle problem and also standardization because real estate has historically been very like um, heterogeneous. Um, but Balcony Dow founded something that's called RE NFT, which is real estate NFT. And it has 3000 different number of dimensions. You can essentially summarize any kind of real estate object, be it, you know, a debt or equity, be it a uh, multifamily or single family or commercial into that RE NFT object. And by doing that, uh, it essentially opens up the door to like anyone to essentially tokenize or bring on chain their real estate. So in this space, a lot of us are trying to essentially be the one to, um, to offer a product, but there aren't a lot of people who's trying to build tools and that's actually, or infrastructure, and that's actually what the field really needs. Um, so those are two products that I really like. And on the more sort of virtual land uh, type uh, you know, of project, I really like Propiverse. So Propiverse actually was one of the other competitors in a real estate uh, Web3 pitch uh, event. Um, that I, uh, you know, Robinland also participated on, on Stunk's platform. And they were one of the top three that won uh, by, uh, you know, based on the judges. And what they're doing is essentially is creating an on-chain equivalence of all of the off-chain land. So essentially all of the plots in the off-chain physical environment, they created an on-chain mirror of that, which they call a twin. And on the twin, you can, you can buy the twin and then you can do different things on the twin without actually having to own the, the offline. So essentially this is doubling the amount of space that we have in this world, which is pretty cool. And they also showed a demo and it's pretty realistic, I would say, although it might be still different than actually being able to you know, walk into a physical space. Um, but that project I think is uh, pretty promising. Um, and that's something that will encourage people to, to look into. Thank you, Scarlett. Uh, how about you, Arthur? Do you want to add something on that? Yeah, I do. I do want to add something um, to um, the favorite, you know, the favorite uh, metaverse land that I love. Um, so one thing I think, if we uh, step back a little bit um, and see where we are uh, in the Web three world, so uh, roughly rough number currently we have probably half a million uh, Ethereum name service users. Uh, unique names uh, existed. Um, and then the real people who is investing in NFTs um, is, is, is less than that. For example, I have multiple ENS myself. So uh, I, to echo uh, Mr. Kens uh, from the last panel, we do have very little buying power compared to the demand we are, that we are creating um, into the you know, Web3 world. So what I'm thinking is, uh, how can we best integrate more Web2 users into the Web3? Um, you know, any metaverse who can bring that will be a key success. Uh, I like this panel because we are talking about real estate and uh, real estate potentially has a way bigger market and users and buyers and sellers. Um, but in terms of the virtual things, um, naturally, I think a gaming industry is one of the critical uh, industries that probably Web3 can bring with us. Um, we have millions, if not billion users, gamers already online. 
um, today. Um, and they are very familiar with the digital economy, like digital assets in their own gaming. So um, if any metaverse can bring that interoperable experience uh, to the game two, sorry, to the web two gamers, I think that will be a key for the success. Um, projects like NFT Wars, uh, Worldwide uh, Webline, and also the Yuga Labs, um, you know, uh, the other, the other side, the other uh, side, these I think are promising. Um, yeah, because they are attracting those peoples. Like NFT Wars, it's a Minecraft, it, it's a Minecraft like gaming platform, which they issue uh, 10,000 NFTs, and uh, theoretically, there can be 10,000 games built on top of that platform. And they also have their token already issued and it's going back down badly, but uh, we are not focusing on our price today, but we are just focusing on the fundamentals. So the, the, the beauty part of that, if you see Minecraft today, it has 140 million active gamers on a monthly basis. Comparing to, we only have half a million, if less web three users so so uh, so that's why i i kind of like what they are doing uh they are um and, and 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 also i'm glad we are in a bear market because um speculators are gone they are washed off and the whole hodlers are here to stay builders are here to stay and i'm sure we will have a bull market um not too far away from now um so uh, and also in a bear market, a lot of gaming uh, development team can really stay here to build, um, to bring the interoperable uh, capability um, to the users. I, I do like that. So other side D uh, is also one of that. Um, the worldwide web line, I, oh, I like it because it's pretty unique. They are only working with a two dimensional uh, metaverse comparing to others are trying to, um, you know, compete for the three dimensional metaverse. So for the 2D, it's easier to implement. And also they have already integrated a lot of the NFT um, ecosystems, like the different NFT projects uh, into that, uh, like CryptoPunk and also a lot of uh, other projects there. So. Uh, I think last week, if not two weeks ago, uh, they announced that they partner with GameStop to further promote their own metaverse. So um, yeah, you can see a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, things start to happening um, in, in the gaming industry. Um, I, and I do like anyone who can bring gamers to the Web3. Um, that's, that's my comment here. Yeah, thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Arthur. Yeah. Uh, since you're very bullish about Web3 gamers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but so let's, uh, yeah, speaking of that, let's ask uh, what's uh, Malvis thought on, yeah, what's your favorite uh, virtual end project since you are coming from the, you know, the game five side? Yeah, for, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, on the gaming ecosystem side, um, my favorite virtual land projects are uh, Decentraline and Sandbox. Um, core to that are that they were the first original, most successful virtual land projects. So they have set the foundation for others uh, to build on top of them or build newer and better versions of virtual uh, lands. Like, for example, Somnium, Crypto Voxels, or some of the others that have come, come up uh, in the past few years. And um, by building um, newer and better ones, um, they can learn from the past successes and also fa failures of. Um, early virtual land uh, projects. And this is only gonna help us grow the metaverse and also um, the virtual uh, land uh, segments. Also, these two projects have helped many traditional enterprises to enter um, and encounter their first crypto experiences and um, the first uh, adoption mechanism for um, marketing real world products into the metaverse. In addition to this, um, so those two projects are ones that I feel are great because at the end of the day, for the future of the metaverse, it's gonna be able to create many use cases where anyone in the world will be able to go in the metaverse to socialize, work, transact, 
play and also create new things. And so we're at the very early phases of that. But then um, some of the key components about metaverse uh, platforms that need to come into play before we're able to um, and engage with and achieve those use cases are we need uh, platforms to be able to enable us to have interconnected virtual worlds, uh, uh, virtual worlds that are persistent and synchronous and they should be also massively scaled. Um, as of now, in terms of uh, scalability, uh, data resources, they can be limited or too costly. So we're still in the early phases of getting these things done. And once we're able to achieve um, such components, there'll be a, in, an immersion between um, virtual uh, reality um, and in addition to even mixed reality, which is the hybrid where, for example, when um, uh, Pokemon Go took uh, everyone's uh, interest a couple of years ago, where it was uh, using your phone, going through your everyday life, but then also interacting with the metaverse. So uh, we're at exciting times and I look forward to seeing what the future brings. Uh, thank you, Mavis. Uh, so the second question I got here, uh, it's, uh, how do you think a blockchain will shape the future of real estate trading and investment? Will it draw a connection between the virtual asset and the real estate industry in reality? Uh, so I would like to direct this question first to Scarlett. Sure, yeah. So I guess uh, to me, this question is very relevant because we're essentially the, uh, the company that's trying to use blockchain technology to bring down the barrier of trading for actual real estate, because traditionally speaking, real estate is a very pe a large piece of asset, uh, has a you know, combination of consumption and investment aspect, which makes it hard both for investors and for consumers actually. And by, uh, so actually my PhD dissertation was precisely about how to create a financial derivative that represents the price aspect of a house, such that owner occupants can just hold on to the underlying asset and can even short this you know, piece of uh, derivative to hedge out the risk while well, investors can hold on to that. And blockchain to me is precisely the quote unquote uh, derivative, a specific form of that. Um, so more, more broadly, what this means is it opens up the two to $3 trillion of crypto market cap to the traditional finance industry. So if we look at crypto, um, it has already reached a pretty large market cap. But the problem is a lot of the liquidity, for example, in USDC or USDT is locked within its own ecosystem. So people holding onto that can only invest in crypto or on-chain assets. Um, but those are usually either you know, stable coin or it's very highly volatile like meme coins, for example. There's nothing in between. So you can think of it as cash or equity, but there's no bonds or fixed income product. But on, on the other hand, real estate is precisely a very uh, you know, steady return type fixed income product that can offer uh, you know, this kind of uh, diversification. So that's why I think by combining these two, essentially you get best of both worlds. One is that people holding on to USDC and USDT during bear market, they have a new option now of putting it into tokenized real estate, for example, through platforms such as Robinland. And without having their uh, stablecoin leaving the ecosystem of blockchain, they can access the return that's in the real world. Um, and that's pretty high, say 8% compared to the 1% that you have in the on-chain environment. On the other hand, this access liquidity of two to three trillion dollar of you know, um, a crypto can help uh, with the financing problem in TradFi, because you know, in, in the US, for example, there are large developers, the top 20 to 30 percent, that have no problem accessing bank financing at very low rates, like four or five percent. But there are a lot of really small developers that has to resort to PEs that have both high rates and bad terms and long turnaround. But on the other hand, in, in you know, crypto, you can disperse funds using you know, the smart contract. And as, as soon as you know, the things or funds are dispersed, you can't really take it back. So it removes a lot of the you know, adverse uh, selection or more hazard or perverted incentive that we see in TradFi between like private placements, um, you know, B2B sales, for example. So um, you know, from, from this front, really the developers are also the ones that's benefiting uh, from this you know, superior technology plus the access amount of liquidity that blockchain unlocks. Um, so really to us, uh, these two things are deemed to work together. And uh, we're, you know, one, one of the many that's trying to bring these two uh, by building a, a you know, DeFi composable uh, protocol that allows 
on-chain liquidity such as USDC to flow into these on off-chain high-yielding assets. Uh, thank you, Scarlett. Um, so Arthur, uh, since you're an investor uh, in some virtual land a metaverse project, uh, so what's your thought on this question? So I, I do think we, um have some barriers. I'm, I'm glad uh, Scarlett is, uh, and her company is working on that. Um, the, the issues I see here is um, education. Um, you know, even uh, for, uh, uh, you know, even uh, for someone who I know um, uh, already purchased Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum, or other uh, altcoins, uh, they, their wallet can be compromised by other, you know, new phishing technologies. Mm -hmm. Because we are talking about decentralized, uh, you know, product or service, so um, not only for them but for the real Web two investors, uh, education is uh, pretty uh, pretty key here to uh, overcome the barrier. Um, so I I do think probably in the long run we will have um, this interconnected. Um, from blockchain to the real estate, but in the short term, I think it's, it's a little bit hard um, because of the education, the knowledge level, the trust level, uh, the security level, your wallet, you know, uh, if, if it's compromised and my ownership of the fractional NFT for a particular real estate get lost, then who is the new owner? Am I still the owner under this decentralized environment? Right, so things like like uh, I would like to um, spread out, uh, but I do see this marriage or integration is very promising in the long run. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Melvis, do you have something to add on this? Yeah, not not too much, not too much more to add, but just to highlight that in terms of how. Um, the future of real estate will be shaped by blockchain is that it's going to enable for the tokenization of real estate assets in, this, in a way that will enable for hard and illiquid assets to be freely traded and accessible to more people around the world and people across the economic um, um, uh, structure, not just um, accredited investors or high net worth, but also people who have a few dimes here and there that they can scrape up and take part in buy a small, a small um, fraction or portion of different real estate um, assets. But in, in order for us to fully get to this um, future vision, um, more regulatory clarity will need to be uh, achieved because as of now, the, the, the ethos of crypto and blockchains um, that, that revolves around decentralization and, and basically being able to monitor your own transactions and assets is not going to fly. There's going to be some aspects of uh, regulatory um, changes that will need to come to play before we're fully able to um, enable this type of future. Mm, do you want to elaborate a little bit, like what what what's the like regular the like what's the aspect of the regulatory? Well, for 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 the first uh, in, in the first uh, aspect of this, in this needs to be more. Um, there needs to be more clarity around what types of um, aspects within the crypto, um, within the crypto ecosystem are deemed a security and what which ones aren't. However, for tokenization, the cool thing about um, blockchain overall is that depending on the on the blockchain that's being used or the entity that's building out the tokenized products, they can either make the aspects of the protocol or token to be permissioned or permissionless. And so, and with it being a uh, permission, they can instate different uh, different uh, rules and parameters to enable people to be able to KYC, do AML, and then also be able to verify the, the different assets or the different um, uh, financial uh, states of the person coming to join the real estate um, asset purchase. And so um, the great thing is that that is something that can be done, but as of now, there's still not um, dedicated bodies uh, within, um, within the government that have clear um, directions as to ruling it. They're still doing research and trying to understand the ecosystem much better before uh, that is fully done. For example, the, between the SEC and the CFTC, they have not, 
actually come up with um, uh, unified clarity around some of the crypto assets. So that's just one aspect of where we need changes first and then um, things will be able to move on. Yeah, I can uh, definitely add a bit onto that. And I totally agree with uh, what the panelists have said about education because it seems like this is still an area that uh, you know needs to be delivered more with clarity. So from our perspective, it's actually pretty clear because there's the how we test, uh, sort of telling people what is classified as a security and what is not. So essentially, if you're issuing an instrument that promises return or actually delivers return with uh, effort of management, then it's classified as a security. So from our perspective, you can there are definitely uh, projects that are trying to walk in the gray area, but we chose to be in the white area and be compliant with all SEC rules. So essentially in the US, if you're trying to issue a security, you usually have to go through the quote unquote registration process, which is what typically known as the IPO, but that's very cumbersome. So there are a few private exemption clauses such as Reg D, Reg S, Reg CF, and Reg A that allows you to issue security through private placement without going through the IPO. But that also means uh, the target audience need to fall under uh, one of these four, for example, uh, if you're a U.S. accredited investor, then it goes under Reg D. If you're non-U.S., then it goes under Reg S, so on and so forth. Um, so to us, then it just means we'll issue on-chain uh, security tokens through Reg D and Reg S, such that uh, we're fully compliant with SEC rules. And the trade-off between this is apparently we're not fully permissionless. So if you want to go fully permissionless for everyone to trade, then you basically violate security law, but otherwise you will need to make sure that you do KYC AML accreditation, allow all of your you know, incoming users such that they fall into one of these two umbrellas. And that's essentially what we are trying to do. This definitely means that there is more overhead, there's more cost going into it. But we think that over the long run, there will be a merge uh, or you know, con convergence between essentially the regulators and the crypto world. Because the reason why crypto had such a boom was essentially because of um, it being outside of regulatory um, scrutiny, to put bluntly. But this is not uh, going to be fully sustainable. Um, and what we've seen right now is that uh, crypto has already started conversation with, for example, regulators among, um, among the big ones. And regulators are also trying to understand, for example, as you mentioned, what is security, what is not, um, how can we uh, make things uh, you know, clearer such, such that there can be innovation? Because for innovation to happen, you need to have clear boundaries, clear yes and no's. So this is a field that's continually to evolve. So at a, at a point uh, in time of right now, we're basically trying to be as careful as possible as to not walk over the fences. And that's the, the, you know, the way that we're adopting. So just wanted to you know, add in on that. Thank you, Scarlett. That's well said. Uh, so, so based on what we have learned from the, our early virtual land project, so what can that be uh, helpful you know, for uh, people who want to build blockchain-based uh, real estate projects? And if we move fast forward, uh, would you envision someday uh, the traditional real estate will be unnecessary you know, for the metaverse generation? I really like this question uh, because I asked, I get asked this a lot. Um, and there are some people for sure who are now just renting instead of buying and they only own virtual land. To me, the reason why real estate, actual real estate wouldn't go away is uh, still because, you know, we're a physical object and we need to, uh, you know, reside somewhere. And because of that, land will still have value. The reason why land keeps going up in value is because there's scarcity. So if you think about it, at least for now, uh, we only have the earth and there's only so much land on earth. And, but on the other hand, the amount of economic activity the entire world incurs keeps going up because technology is advancing rapidly. And that's why per unit land, the amount of activity on it is increasing in, in value. And that's why the land also in, in, you know, increases in value because the activity usually needs to take place somewhere, even though a lot of it is virtual now. But if you think about it, all the databases um, you know, the personnel or labor also needs to reside. So that's why uh, from a consumption perspective, uh, either the firms or the people, they still need a residence. That's why uh, real estate or, you know, especially land, the value wouldn't go away. But on the other side, 
when I think about you know metaverse, really I think it's a new version of essentially the space of internet. Because if you look at a lot of these metaverse um, projects, the reason why land is worth something is because big brands such as Gucci, LV, Adidas, Nike are going there to, to market themselves. Um, because people's attention is li limited. It used to be the case that people spend their time or you know, time eyebrow eyeballing on, for example, Google, you know, Google search search engine website. That's why the ad space is like it's kind of like a piece of land in the web two world. And that's, you know, going up in prices. But then now with the new uh, generation, a lot of them are actually, you know, ditching essentially web two and going to web three in terms of their attention. And that's why metaverse or, you know, metaverse land has value is because people are de devoting some amount of time of, and attention there. And that's why the, the brands, whenever it comes to, for example, uh, you know, marketing, you know, activity, they, they need to go there as well. So that's why in terms of that, it will still definitely go up in value. It, the, my only worry is, you know, in, in physical land, we only have one earth, unless we go to Mars, you know, there's limited resources. But for virtual lands, you can always have new projects such as the, you know, there will be Decentraland, there will be, and then there, for example, there's also Nama, there's Sandbox. Now there's, for example, you know, other otherwise. So, as, as soon as we have a new one, then, you know, this is uh, essentially diluting the amount of uh, scarcity that we already have in the previous land. Um, so that's the reason why I'm a bit worried about how, uh, how much price can go up. Um, but I think collectively, for sure, to the total value will be go going up. It's just that for individual project, it's a bit like condo versus single family, because you can always build new condos. So the older ones will at some point be obsolete and people will favor the new ones. That's why people usually recommend buying single family instead of condo if you have the, have the money. So physical land is a bit like single family. There's only so much, um, but virtual land is a bit like you know condo, but both of them has value. So that's uh, kind of my take on this. Thank you, that's very interesting. Uh, so Arthur, do you, I saw you were smiling and nodding. Do you have something to add on that? Yeah, I fully uh, support Stella's uh, comment. Uh, you know, I think um, one thing we need to think about, uh, about whether a real physical land or virtual land is the utility perspective and also from an investment perspective. Uh, from, a pan uh, from, from my, I'm a financial planner. So I talked to my client, hey, you live in Silicon Valley, you want to buy a self-living home, buy it. Whether it's at the top, you buy it at the top or it's the bottom, because it's the utility that you need. So we don't consider it even as an investment at all. So you need to leave some place. So if you, you know, if you want the ownership, then you buy it. Um, but from an investment perspective, I do see the metaverse land potentially may uh, go up uh, way more than the physical land if you are choosing the right project and the right community, the, the right um, centralized um, developers. So, so that, that's, that's my take on that. I don't think, I, I think we will for sure rely on physical war, uh, land to live on, but as you can see, as Scarlett mentioned, major brands are moving into metaverse um, to attract Gen Z or even later younger generations. Um, for what? For, for uh, economy activities. You know, they're selling products there. They are uh, uh, having the great uh, experience that they never had before, like virtual reality and also tokenomics. You know, if you own the ape corn and uh, you can transit you can you know uh transit in in the in the yuga labs ecosystem so so i think if you choose the right project um uh, stay with it uh, have a long-term vision investment perspective the right project may give you much more gain than the uh, physical land but we do need physical land to lead yeah thank you author so since uh, we have uh, two founders uh, in this panel, and then also Arthur, you are from the investor side, I think the next question will be uh, perfect for this panel. Uh, so for young people uh, who are interested in uh, moving to uh, the Web3 uh, virtual land or metaverse, uh, 
you know, in this area, uh, what skill set do you think are essential for them to have? So I'll start with, uh, with Scarlett again. Um, to me, I think actually the skill of learning new things is the most important and open mindset. For example, for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm more of a researcher academic and I was looking at TradFi real estate um, and, uh, you know, crypto is a complete new world to me that I only started getting to know seriously since I would say last year in June, but now I'm actually a builder or slash founder in the space trying to bridge the two. And every day I'm learning new things and realizing that actually most of the people in crypto that I met are usually three months or six months in as well, uh, similar to me. Um, so that's the, a sign of the space growing really fast is that more than half of its people are, you know, just in it and being like five year old is like already a dinosaur. And this also means there's a lot of real opportunity because it's still being shaped. It's unlike TradFi or say investment banking, for example, that's been around for 80 years and the rules are written and you just need to follow it. Um, so that's why having an open mindset and re realizing that the quote unquote rules are not set rules is, you know, something that you can break and you should try to even, you know, think of ways to break it is really important. For example, the Theopatra lab example I mentioned, most of the people are trying to follow SEC regulations rigidly by following say Reg D, Reg S, but they're like, what if we find a technology that overcomes it um, and circumvents it? And then they found Stacks blockchain where, you know, uh, you know transfer of uh, essentially profits are regarded mining. And this is essentially using technology to solve a legal problem. And we need more minds like that um, to co collectively shape the field together. Um, so that's why I think um, the, I, you know, uh, the intention to learn and having an open mindset is the mo most important skill set for this field. Thank you, Scarlett. Um, so Malvis, what's your take based on your journey? Yes. Um... So uh, within uh, this ecosystem and um, new uh, kids who are interested in uh, trying to join, the main uh, mentality that people need to have if they're interested in this area are to be entrepreneurial and accepting and adaptive to constant change. Uh, the crypto market moves uh, a lot and is still in this nascent phase. So with this mentality and because the crypto world is so new, there really are not truly well-defined skill sets that are obviously necessary for success. Um, there are many uh, traditional technology, fintech, banking, marketing, broader enterprise roles that are being transformed to Web3. And since the majority of Web3 entities are still relatively startups, everyone wears multiple hats. So um, you kind of have to be a jack of all traits. You can't go into the ecosystem on just one singular mindset or one skill set that you think you're going to just join and uh, try to uh, grow within it. You have to be very flexible. And also, you may join a project with skill sets in programming, relationship management, fundraising, or something else. But at the end of the day, you need to be malleable to the changes of the overall ecosystem to survive. And so coming in, just ha having an initial passion in the broader ecosystem is, is, is definitely uh, very important, but you shouldn't be grounded to all of your past skill set. You have to be very uh, open-minded and uh, hard work and try to learn other aspects of the ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, I think both uh, both of you mentioned that uh, you know, like Web three is a really fast moving uh, field, and five years can be a long time. Uh, so if we you know look five years from now, let's say if we have a five years reunion uh, from today, uh, and then what do you think? What we're gonna talk at the time? Uh, where what would be the trend? You know, of metaverse in the next five years. Uh, so how about Arthur? So. Um... Crypto perspective, we are currently 1996 or 1998 of the internet. So in five years, we're probably, we're still early. We're, we're right now, we're early, but in five years, we will be still early. So I would, have, I would envision there could be uh, some potential um, metaverse success stories, like people can uh, learn things there, um, social networking there, and make transactions there, uh, buy things there, uh, sell things there, earn money there. 
Um, but I don't think it will be a major uh, disrupt, disrupt to the traditional industry. Um, but in the long run, uh, I do see a huge potential in this area. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Scarlett, what's your thought? I think this is actually pretty interesting. I was listening to the previous panel and they're saying it could be the case that in five years where even we're not even talking about blockchain because it's taken as a norm. It's like part of our life and potentially like everything are on chain already. So we wouldn't be talking about bringing real estate on chain or like how to merge these two worlds. Uh, but I agree with Arthur that it might be a, a bit too soon because we're still dealing with some of the regulatory concerns, also infrastructure. I think these two are the two main blockers because you know, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, the reason why uh, say tokenization of real estate wasn't that easy was for example, the price Oracle problems. How do we ag agree upon the price of a piece of real estate that's off chain? Unlike, you know, say ETH that's completely on chain and all the transaction history is, you know, fully visible. And also how do we standardize things? Because, you know, you can either have non-fundable token or fundable token, but real estate is kind of somewhere in between. So there's a lot of things that need to be solved uh, from an infra for infrastructure and tool perspective that hasn't been yet. So I hope that over the next five years, there will be more companies working on that to enable us, uh, you know, to do this easier. And also from a regulatory perspective, would love more clarity from, for example, SEC uh, and for example, all the other institutions on what exactly can be done and what cannot be done and how can we do this. And hopefully if we can have those all solved, over the next five years, we will see a burst of say, you know, essentially the converge of on-chain versus off-chain real estate and uh, also other perspectives. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, since we are limited by the time, uh, we have to uh, move to the Q&A session now. Uh, so I do got some question already on the chat. Uh, and then just a reminder uh, for our audience on both uh, Zoom and uh, Twitter space and YouTube, uh, you can drop your questions to the chat or the comments. Uh, so the first question uh, is, uh, what do you think of, uh, what's the relationship uh, with, uh, between the gamify and the metaverse? What do you think of, uh, so it's is metaverse critical for gamify uh i think that question seems very relevant to malvis experience so would you like to take that question first yeah that's um actually um sorry yeah so that question actually fits very perfectly with um what fanacore is looking to develop um in the sense that uh building a platform that brings together um, the ecosystem of uh, gamers, which entails the, the developers, the players, investors, and studios into one main harmonious uh, ecosystem. This creates the infrastructure or the platform to enable for uh, game designers and also uh, gamers to be able to in, um, learn more about the metaverse in addition to partake in it. Because um, within the different games that are being developed and within the overall gaming ecosystem, um, almost about 175 to 200 um, billion dollars is, is generated. And we have over like 3 billion people around the world that are engaged within gaming one way or another. But through um, gamifying the current Web2 games and building new ones within the crypto ecosystem, it enables for people to take ownership and also be able to monetize off of their um, successes or uh, interactions within, within games. And so um, being able to use NFTs as a means for people to uh, showcase uh, ownership or uh, be able to uh, monetize within different games is a great means of um, merging the two. Uh, one other thing too is that like the metaverse has always existed across um, the video game ecosystem. So uh, within it now we're bringing blockchain and also the the components of crypto to expand upon it. And uh, gaming is a very good and um, and so it's a very good and easy way of um, streamlining adoption across the ecosystem. Because as of late, the crypto ecosystem has merged around uh, financial uh, use cases and applications uh, initially, uh, but then gradually it's gonna evolve to a state where I had mentioned earlier, where 
we could use the ecosystem to socialize, um, work, transact, to and also to play and create new versions of things that we see in the real world and port it into the digital world as well. So yeah, it's very synonymous, I would say, in terms of GameFi and Metaverse in, in answering the question at a high level. Well said, Malvis. Uh, so our next question is, um, uh, how does real estate tokenization protect and enforce physical property ownership? Uh, should there be uh, a central authorization to, uh, to be part of the solution? So I see uh, that can be directed to Scarlett. Sure, yeah. I think it has to do a lot with a, a consensus system. So right now, for example, the recognition of ownership exists off chain with the county government. The, the government essentially keeps a ledger of who owns what. And then there is title insurance company that acts as a private player to ensure that that's actually true. And if it's not true, then they can essentially insure you on the compensation. Uh, but if we want to essentially move it completely on chain, then we're changing to another consensus system where information is stored decentrally um, in a de decentralized way, um, you know, off essentially the, the, the government ledger. Then how do we merge these two? And if there's a discrepancy, uh, what do we resort to as the ultimate source of truth? Then it's a very interesting issue because after all, a piece of land exists off chain in the physical world. So if you really uh, run into a problem, you, uh, I, you, in principle, you still go to the, the court and the court exists off chain with the, with the legal you know, infrastructure that we have uh, in Web2. So that's why uh, I foresee there still being some challenges of completely moving this on chain. What I think could happen is on chain act as essentially a sort of a, a site because we can track a transaction history really easily in an on chain environment. For example, from now on, uh, we, we try to essentially trace back uh, who sold a piece of land to whom and then put that in an on chain environment so that at least we can eliminate a title insurance company because they essentially. Uh, act as a private player um, to assist the actual legal uh, environment. So that's something I think is a first step blockchain can do in terms of guaranteeing ownership rights. And then the next step really would be how uh, you know, the government can act uh, you know, accordingly to what uh, the entry environment agrees upon. So that's uh, essentially my take on this. Thank you, Scarlett. Uh, so we got another question here. Uh, it's uh, how to evaluate metaverse real estate project and what are the trends for metaverse land in the future? Uh, I think uh, Arthur, you'll be, would you like to answer this question? Sure, I will give, uh, give my two cents. Uh, first, only invest using your money that you, you are able to uh, fully lost, okay, in this world, because this is so wild. Uh, it's so young um, and you can see there could be quite a lot of speculators going into this world instead of uh, investors. So if you are sitting there every day looking to the open sea and looking at the floor price, you will have a heartbreak because you will get burned by the traders, not the holders. So from my perspective, uh, it's very similar to invest into a uh, Web2 um, <laughs> gaming project at the moment, at the moment. Um, so I think you evaluate the project to see, as, as Mr. Ken uh, mentioned, we need uh, the buying powers. So whoever can bring the major people into their own community, into their own gaming environment, into their own met uh, metaverse, that's the project you want to invest. You always want to have, uh, so, so in that words, they can attract new people coming into the platform. At the same time, the new people will bring their friends as well as funding, money, connection, resources into the ecosystem. So, so those things uh, I, I would like to invest. And um, that, that's why I can uh, invest more into the gaming side of the metaverse right now because I do see that potentially can be a game changer or major breakthrough uh, to bring large Web2 people into Web3. Uh, but the real estate part, um, I'm not doing anything. I'm glad I'm here today learning a lot of things. Um, 
but probably down the road uh, when, because I mean, crypto is so young and so little industry size wise, right? Um, I think uh, uh, m- maybe right now one or two uh, trillions worldwide is tiny compared to all other major industries. So, so um, yeah. So my my suggestion is only invest uh, money that you are able to fully lose it, uh, and also you are playing with speculators. So be a huddle mentality, look into their discord, learn what the team is doing, like their roadmap, how they are programming or progressing on their project. And more importantly, how many Web2 people they can bring into the Web3. So that that will be my strategy uh, in terms of evaluating different projects. Thank you so much, Arthur. Uh, I think that's uh, some very useful tips uh, you know, for people who are investing in the Web3 these days. Uh, so I know there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions still coming up, but we are actually running out of time. Uh, and uh, we have the contact information uh, for all the uh, panelists on the on, on, dropped on the chat. So feel free to reach out if you want to uh, connect and have a more further conversation. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And then thank you so much, uh, all the panelists, uh, for your uh, input and sharing your experience. Uh, And I have learned a lot from you. And I hope everyone uh, also had a great experience today.